Hello and welcome. My name is Melanie and I am from the meeting support team here at South South North. I'd like to run you through some housekeeping points before we start today's session. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available shortly on the AF 2020 website and we welcome you to revisit the content and share with your colleagues. All attendees will be kept on mute, but may use the Q&A box for questions. You are encouraged to post questions in the Q&A box at any point during the webinar. These will be addressed during the dedicated Q&A sessions. Remember to post questions in the Q&A box only. Questions posted in the chat box may be missed by our moderators. The audience also has the ability to upvote and comment on questions which have already been posted. So keep an eye on the Q&A box throughout the session and feel free to upvote questions which you would like to have answered. This webinar runtime is 90 minutes. I'll now pass on to Ms. Swati Palai for the welcome remarks and setting the context. Good evening. On behalf of Adaptation Futures 2020 Secretariat, I extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists and our audience to the third pre-conference webinar series. The tagline for the sixth edition of Adaptation Futures is Accelerating Adaptation Action, aligning with the Global Commission of Adaptations, goal of 2020 being the year of action on adaptation. As the year 2020 has panned out, the sixth edition of Adaptation Futures ceases to be a one-off event ending with just a conference. With two successful webinar series behind us, and this is the third one, I'm happy to say that the momentum has been successfully maintained with regular enriching dialogue on a wide range of perspectives that pulls together a wide range of stakeholders, not just limited to academia. The Adaptation Research Alliance with action-oriented and user-centered centered research at its core addresses the much pressing requirement of the need for scaling up investments, capacity building at individual and institutional level, collaborations for research and innovation, and to address the co coordinational and implementational gaps. This symbiotic collaboration is very exciting for it adeptly addresses the missing link between policymakers, funders, academia, and practitioners working within the adaptation spectrum. So without much delay, I welcome Dr. Anand Patwardhan, the Chair of Adaptation Futures 2020 Science Committee and one of the key initiators of Adaptation Research Alliance. Dr. Patwardhan, the platform's all yours. Thank you very much, Swati, and a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone here. Um, we have a really distinguished uh, group of um, panelists and speakers. Um, and so we'd like to get started with the, with the webinar uh, right away. Uh, I just want to add my words of welcome to, to Swati's on behalf of the World Adaptation Science Program uh, or WASP, which is one of the co-sponsors of Adaptation Futures 2020 along with Terry. Uh, WASP is an international program devoted to uh, facilitating adaptation research and ensuring that it gets effectively used in supporting action and implementation. So the topic of today's uh, webinar could not have been more appropriate. Uh, we have all recognized that knowledge is central to the adaptation enterprise, uh, both knowledge in terms of knowledge of the problem and the risks of climate change, but also critically knowledge of the solutions, what to do about how we manage those risks. And, but as a critical step in that process then is to make sure that we uh, have the knowledge that is needed, where it is needed and by whom it is needed. And in a way that is the, the underlying theme of adaptation futures of knowledge to action. So this webinar uh, will focus on the topic of action research, uh, which is trying to gain a little bit more understanding of the kind of research we'd like to see happening uh, that is relevant and important for adaptation, uh, what that is, uh, what are some good examples of that action research in practice, uh, why is it uh, so critical, and how can we make it happen, how can we scale it up. Uh, the format of the webinar, as you would have seen from the agenda, is we are starting off with a short 
30 minute uh, opening session, which will then uh, merge on to a panel discussion. Uh, the opening session is meant to set the stage and set the scene for what, how we think about action research. And uh, we can't think of a better person to do that uh, to set us off than uh, Sheila Patel. Uh, Sheila really needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, she exemplifies uh, the combination of knowledge and action that is the subject of this webinar. She's the founder and director of the Society for Promotion of Area Resource Centers, or SPARC, uh, an NGO that has been in the forefront of community organizations of the urban poor to access secure housing and basic amenities. Uh, she's also a founder and current chairperson of SDR, Slum Dwellers International, uh, which is a global network of community-based organizations uh, in 33 countries. Uh, so let me turn over to, uh, to Sheila for her uh, opening thoughts on, uh, on action research and the importance of connecting knowledge uh, with, uh, with practice. Thank you, Anand. How much time are you giving me? Um, we have about five to seven minutes for each of the opening okay. sessions to leave some uh, room in the opening for a few questions if there are. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me and I'm delighted to be here in this space and to have these discussions. Uh, for me, the most exciting part of this process is actually about examining uh, the potential of people who in the past have been objects of everybody's research to actually become uh, partners and very central to the design and execution of research. And for me, that is more critical and important than what name you give it as action, participatory, whatever, whatever. Because by and large, if the activity of research has been seen from the point of view of those of us who are operating on the grassroots as professionals supporting communities, we end up becoming the field soldiers who go around answering, getting answers to questionnaires designed somewhere far away by people on hypothesis that we have never participated in to produce information that is not checked by us or asked whether it's useful to produce policies that don't work for us. And so any exploration to transform this vertical dysfunctional hierarchy into a process which says that all of us, regardless of where we sit on this planet and what are the different levels of hierarchies that have trapped us, have the opportunity to explore examining challenges of how to produce knowledge that identifies the critical structural and process vulnerabilities on the ground that have to deal with the climate change space. How do we identify its ingredients? How do we collectively contribute our own experience and knowledge to produce a framework? And how do we collaborate to produce ideas, strategies, and information that would in turn help us develop a strategy for action. So accompanying this process also makes me question the reason why people who do research are a separate community and those who fund it fall in another category and those of us who have to practically explore solutions and transformation on the ground are like a third party in this process. What would happen if we all sat together and said these are the roles that we play in solving the serious long-term wicked challenge of climate change and look at ways by which we produce knowledge that helps poor people, especially vulnerable, intergenerationally, disadvantaged people to transform the cultures of survival in which they find solutions that are dysfunctional to be part of this 
planetary transformation in which everything we do contributes to the change that we all aspire to have. And so every bit counts, but our paradigm shift also counts. So the important contribution that people like us will make is seek the right to challenge the stuff that comes from all of you sitting somewhere far away from the location in which transformation has to occur. And then ask you tough and difficult questions to say, how is it going to work for us? What can we contribute? And for me, the most exciting module that I always refer to in this process is that we always refer to private sector as the group from whom we want to seek inspiration. I don't like most of the inspiration they give us, but the one that I like is that when they produce strategies and ideas, they have a whole research and development component in which they design solutions with the people who have to utilize and, in, and take on the solutions in, that, in their case to purchase the products that they want, but in our case to adapt and adopt ways of functioning in our day-to-day -day lives that is good for us, that's good for the planet, and that can be supported by the duty bearers, local, global, and others. So how can we transform the research space from being somewhere in a cloister away from anything that produces the so-called knowledge in a separate box, then have another box of people who make policies, and then another box of people who finance it? Why can't we all work together to make this a continuum and where we share knowledge, ideas, strategies, and while we demand the right to ask you this uncomfortable questions, we also bequeath you the right to ask us uncomfortable questions. Because it's the inability for us to communicate that produce all these onerous risks and these uh, uh, reputational challenges to large institutions to lend money to the very people whose lives you have all made commitments to change. So for me, Anand, this strategy of exploring the possibility of collectively exploring transformative knowledge, which I believe is as much the right of poor people to participate in research as it is you as academics, our municipalities and our national governments as duty bearers, uh, bilateral and philanthropic institutions by the potential to give resources for it. Two, to say, let's break the barriers. Uh, let's give it a nicer name than action research. So I hope that will be one of the outcomes that you get from here. So I'll stop here and I'd love to spend much more time in an interaction in which we answer each other's questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. That was really inspiring. I mean, I was particularly struck, I think, as you opened by by your point about uh, moving from, uh, you know, this notion of objects uh, of research to being active uh, shapers and participants and designers of that enterprise. And I think what you have called for is really a, a paradigm shift in how not just what research we do, but how we do it. How does that research enterprise actually work, and then uh, and connect to connect to action? Uh, it's really inspiring, and I, I hope that we will get some more concrete ideas as we proceed through the webinar. Um, I'd like to turn to our next opening uh, speaker for her sort of stage setting remarks um, and invite Helen O'Connor. Helen is the Senior Climate and Environment Advisor for UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO's African Regional Department. She has over 20 years of experience in climate change uh, across different domains from research to policy to programming. Uh, she spent several years in South Asia recently where she has actually seen firsthand uh, some of the work of researchers uh, in areas related to, to women, disasters and livelihood. Um, and she's part of the homeward world bound network of women with a background in STEM, uh, seeking to support and enable more voice and recognition uh, for women with a science background in decision making and leadership. Um, so Helen, the uh, floor is yours. 
thank you. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me um, to talk this morning. I'm really looking forward to, to listening in to the conversations which come after this. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments based, I suppose, on my my role representing obviously a, a, a national government, a national government policy organisation, and one which obviously um, takes a lot of decisions with regard to the financing um, of, for example, the, the research and action that um, Sheila referred to in her opening remarks. Um, but I'm also going to try and just draw on a, a couple of um, experiences that I've had myself, which I hope will further demonstrate the importance of this kind of co-design, this working together, bringing together the, the policy makers or the program designers with the researchers and communities to really think about how we can make the biggest impact um, that we can on the climate adaptation agenda. So if I can just broadly start with why it is that the research is so important for what we do in development. And I think, you know, we all agree, hopefully we all agree that it, the, the evidence and the understanding as to what works for whom and why is absolutely critical to help inform both our policies and also our um, investment decisions. I'm thinking about an example that we had uh, many years ago now with um, setting a strategy for our investment and engagement in water sanitation and hygiene, for example where, if I'm honest, it's not the sexiest topic. Sanitation and toilets and, you know, pipes or lack of pipes, it's not the sexiest topic for a minister to get behind straight away. But it's something that by bringing the evidence, by bringing the research, by bringing the voices of the people that that lack of sanitation access, you know, what that means for them, um, is was absolutely critical in really delivering a level of commitment uh, from ministers um, on a subject which otherwise perhaps they would, um, like naturally people wouldn't necessarily want to, to champion and get behind. And we did that through a whole range of different means, including bringing the researchers and linking up with some of the communities who had been working on the challenges in actually improving access to sanitation services for so many years. And that was so important in really bringing it to life and helping ministers and others understand and therefore take action to increase the level of commitment. Going forward with COVID, I'm conscious that the evidence is going to be so important for the investment as well that goes behind the policy. As people are looking at where to invest in a post-COVID recovery, where to invest potentially in some areas more limited resources, understanding what can be done, what will work for who, with the right set of enabling environments is going to be absolutely key. And the people, the bringing together of the researchers and the communities who are most closely related to the outcomes that we're trying to see is a really important part of then hopefully helping channel some of that investment to those communities who need it the most. I think that when I'm talking as a as someone who works in a big policy organisation, I think it's really important to understand the politics behind how people take those decisions. And it really, therefore, strongly reiterates this need to start and work with those people who are going to have to make these decisions as early as possible. Is the more we can bring people together as early as possible into the research process to really understand the questions that policymakers are perhaps asking or the types of investments that people are talking about and really start at that very early stage to work through what might be possible and what the evidence says, I think the bigger the impact we can have. And with a particular focus on climate, we all know climate change is happening, it's happening now, adaptation and resilience and increasing our focus and our investment into actions which can really help the poorest and the most vulnerable are abs is absolutely critical. We've been talking about it, you know, for, for many years. Um, it's not gone away. It's getting, you know, that need has become greater. And I think that there are some great opportunities to learn from some of the co-design work that has been done and think about how we can adopt some of those techniques into future research to really help think through how can we build this scale? How can we meet the scale of ambition? 
So I'm going to do a little plug for some work that we've been supporting in East Africa through a program called WISER, which is a weather and climate information um, services program, essentially, where at its heart, it was about trying to work with communities to think about the data, the information that they needed to enable them to take action or to enable them to better plan, um, for example, the implications it meant for them for fishing on lake on lakes. So I remember talking to someone who said, it's no point in saying the wave is going to, you know, there's an increased risk of waves <laughs> that are going to be however high. It was about trying to explain to people what that meant for them in their boat. That was what was important to them. What would it feel like? And therefore, how better to communicate that evidence around what was happening with the weather for them to be able to understand what it meant for them. And so there's been some really great work through that at a local level. How can we build on that? How can we scale up those sorts of techniques? And I think I'd end, therefore, with something that I remember very warmly from Bangladesh and from my work in Bangladesh. And I know there are colleagues on this call from, from Bangladesh. Um, and I recall going to the first Gobeshona conference that Salim al Haq organised in Dhaka, and where he focused very much on this question, how do we bring the research and the policymakers and the investors together? How do we better shape and use the research and the amazing experience of researchers, civil society groups and others across Bangladesh to really help steer investment and steer the response into those areas which will make the biggest difference to people living in Bangladesh and I think that has gone on from strength to strength every year, as far as I'm aware. And I follow it sometimes on Twitter. Um, and it's fantastic to see that that focus on how do we work with policymakers? How do we work with the donors? How do we work with communities? Is there There's a lot of experience? How can we build on some of this to inform the actions that we need for this massive need and the ambition that I think we all have to scale up workable solutions for adaptation and resilience? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. That was really inspiring. I think your call to build bridges across very different communities that don't tend to interact with each other is very well taken. And we're also heartened by, I think, the examples you pointed to where it has been possible to do that. And I think uh, what's therefore of critical importance is how we learn from those examples and scale that up, uh, which is something hopefully we might be able to do through the Adaptation Research Alliance. So this brings us to our next opening speaker, um, and it's uh, I'm really happy that it's Rosalind West. Uh, Dr. West leads on climate adaptation and resilience research at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. She's responsible for some major research programs, such as Future Climate for Africa, uh, which really is trying to actually implement on the ground the kind of action research uh, that we are discussing in this webinar. Uh, she's also responsible for providing advice to ministers regarding weather and climate science and was a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society in 2019 for the innovative use of weather and flood forecasting uh, for humanitarian um, emergencies. And it's been uh, my, my real privilege and, and honor to have been working with Rosalind on the development of the Adaptation Research Alliance. And so over to you, Rosalind. Thank you so much, Anand, and um, thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk to you all today. And it's great to see so many people that are dialed into the webinar. And so I'm just going to give um, a little bit of an introduction to this Adaptation Research Alliance that I've also you know, had the privilege of working with Anand and many others on developing over the last um, few um, months. And um, I'm going to just set the context for that now in, in the context of um, the UK's presidency of COP26. So if we could move on to the next slide, that'd be great. So as you know, the, um, the UK in partnership with Italy is hosting COP26 in November of, of next year now. And um, you know, this has a, it's a very important um, COP meeting um, and really for increasing the level of action um, considerably on, on climate change, both you know, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement on reducing emissions, on adaptation and building resilience, and on mobilizing finance. So we know that decarbonization of the global economy needs to proceed at three to five times faster over the next decade than in the last two decades, and also 
critically that adaptation and resilience need to be strengthened as the impacts of climate change are happening now and of course will worsen in the future if we continue on our current trajectories. Now, the, as you can see in this diagram, the UK presidency has chosen five campaigns for COP26, um, adaptation and resilience, energy, nature, transport and finance. And we'll also try and look at the co-benefits in between those. And um, we're going to focus um, today on um, adaptation and resilience. So if we just look at the next slide. Um, so the, this is all about turning the ambition um, um, into action. Um, so, um, and the UK's um, COP presidency adaptation resilience campaign is um, intending to encourage greater political ambition and action, tools, coordination and commitments to build the resilience um, through practical adaptation, preparedness and response. Now, the campaign has got three main focus areas. The first of those is a major shift of um, the, the call for action that was instigated at the UN Climate Action Summit um, last year. Um, which is now being implemented through this framework of action and a number of initiatives listed there. And then this um, implementation of the call for action will be complemented by major commitments on adaptation finance and on disaster risk protection to really turn that ambition into action at COP26. Now central to this, this adaptation is adaptation best practice and, and the backbone of that best practice is around action-centered, user-orientated research that really targets the needs of the most vulnerable. And this is what we have been um, working on over the last few months to really think, how can we, how can, what can we do? What can we do to seize the opportunity of COP26 and to bring that action-orientated research on adaptation and resilience to the fore? So if we move to the next um, slide. Um, we'll, um, so we, we want to um, increase this focus on action oriented research um, and which really provides that better understanding of, of climate risks, better understanding of decision making tools and better practical solutions and that that all needs to be to be co developed with the people that will be using those tools. So I've got an example here from the AMA. 2050 program um, in, in West Africa. And actually this is illustrating the project that occurred in, in Senegal. Um, and you know, we show on the left here, you know, better risk information is of course useful. You know, here we're, we're illustrating how crop yields in the Sahel have already decreased and are projected to decrease further. But in, having that better risk information is no good if we can't use it to make better decisions. So then in the center here, we've got a nice illustration of the development of this decision-making tool like this plateau game, which is being used here to aid peanut farmers in using and applying that improved risk information for informing their decision-making. And then thirdly on the right here, we've also got some um, you know, much better solutions to some of the challenges um, of, of agriculture under climate change. Um, and here we've, we're showing um, research on genetic diversity of millet and on agricultural practices, which will address current and future climate risks. So I think the, you know, the really important thing for um, adaptation and resilience research, it's not just about defining the problem, but we really need to move from that to finding solutions um, through this user-centered, action-orientated research. So, um, and I think if we move to the next slide, I think across our community, it's clear that the current level of support for adaptation and resilience research is, is currently insufficient. We're lacking coordination and we're not effectively linked through. That research is not all effectively linked through to the in implementation. And therefore it can't quite yet address the, the magnitude or the urgency of those practical actions that we really need to build a climate resilient future. But I think, um, and we've established through a lot of the conversations that we've had already and through, I hope that we'll establish further today that together we can change this. And I really liked um, Sheila's remark earlier about what would happen if we all sat together. And I think that's what we'd like to explore through this idea of an adaptation research alliance. Um, we can bring together adaptation researchers, the action communities, research funders, action funders, bring those people together and really seek to increase our capacity and funding for action orientated research and that really can support effective adaptation to climate change to deliver um, tangible solutions. So the rest of the webinar, I think, will examine that question of what we really mean by action research 
and why it's so important to help bring about that adaptation and resilience that's so badly needed um, by communities all around the world. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Rosalind. And I think uh, your remarks on uh, on the on the webinar and the role it might play in this uh, new initiative on the Adaptation Research Alliance are very well taken. Um, so we have uh, kind of, uh, I think, got a very rich agenda laid out by our opening speakers. I do not see any uh, immediate questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so uh, we will move forward directly with the panel discussion. We will have, of course, time uh, after we have heard from our panelists for some Q&A. We hope there'll be some lively discussion on going through the Q&A box. Uh, please use that to post your questions, um, to vote on questions you think are particularly important and that need to be addressed. So what we have heard from our opening uh, opening uh, speakers has been really kind of a vision of what is needed. Uh, Sheila started with, with describing a vision of, of what could happen or what could be achieved uh, if you all actually sat together, uh, very different communities. Uh, that theme was picked up by, uh, by Helen. And I think uh, Rosalind has laid out uh, some very interesting ideas for how this could come together uh, and use the COP next year as a moment in time to really drive uh, this agenda forward, to enable uh, scaling up and accelerating action on building resilience and adaptation. So we're really fortunate to have a very distinguished set of panelists uh, with actual direct experience in how this may be accomplished. And uh, uh, we have a total of seven panelists who are coming from very different communities, from action communities, uh, from science communities, from funding agencies, representing uh, these diverse uh, communities that we want to bring together, as has been uh, mentioned in the opening remarks. Um, just a couple of words to sort of set up the, uh, the, the panel. Um, uh, we have encouraged uh, panelists to stick to five minutes. Uh, for their remarks uh, to give us time for questions at the end. Um, I will pose a kind of a leading question to uh, to help stimulate or prompt their, uh, prompt their remarks. Uh, we do have a couple of panelists who may be sharing uh, some slides as well. So the way the, uh, the sequence uh, follows as we are starting off with, um, with panelists who really come from that world of action and civil society and community-based organizations. Uh, we will then move to uh, panelists who come from uh, the research community, but who have worked very closely with policy and practice to really gain an understanding of what are some of the good examples of where this has worked. Um, and then at the end, uh, we have um, uh, panelists who can speak again to diverse uh, uh, from both from a research funding perspective, but also from uh, a broader perspective of academia and science academies. So once again, uh, let's start off with the with the panel discussion. I think one point that has come up uh, this uh, this morning and keeps coming up is the centrality of knowledge in the process of adaptation. And I think it's important for us to look at the full dimension of that knowledge, right? We are not looking just at knowledge of the problem, which is very important. And that often means better understanding of risks. Who is at risk? Why are they at risk? And how are they at risk? Right? But then it also means solution knowledge, which is knowledge about what do we do with that risk? How do we manage it? How do we address it? How do we reduce it? Maybe prevent it, recover from it. And it's that combination of problem and solution knowledge which is so critical. Uh, and it is exactly that uh, which needs to be then done in a participatory and a co-developed manner along with those who are supposed to use that knowledge and make decisions to uh, safeguard themselves. To start off the uh, panel, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Farah Kabir. Uh, Farah has been working in the field of development and research for uh, for many for over two decades. Uh, she started her career with the Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, uh, but currently she is the country director of ActionAid Bangladesh uh, since June of 2007. 
Um, she has been really active in uh, in a whole range of programs uh, in in Bangladesh, and I think can can really speak to us about what it means uh, to have research supporting action uh, on the ground. So. As a starting question, uh, uh, Farah, as a leading civil society organization in Bangladesh that, that works at the local level, um, how do you see, what are your expectations from the research community? How do you see them engaging in action on the ground? Over to you. Um, uh, it's an interesting question and also uh, I've been enriched by listening to the uh, speakers before me. Um, so ActionAid works directly with communities with the most marginalized, those in poverty, those in exclusion. And uh, you also know that uh, in Bangladesh, we have been prone to cyclones and um, to uh, multiple disasters. But what was becoming uh, over the last 15 years, becoming quite obvious was that uh, the frequency and the intensity of the disasters. So before I respond to your question about what do we expect from uh, the researchers and so on, uh, the, my ground reality after taking on the position of Action Aid uh, in 2007 was we were uh, in development intervention. We were looking at uh, economic empowerment. We were looking at transforming life uh, uh, with the community together. Our perception and approach was always rights-based and in uh, uh, cooperation with the community. But the communities we were working with were constantly at risk, constantly facing disasters. So in a span of my fix, first six months, I had to respond to one disaster or the other. Action Aid Bangladesh was dealing with other floods, waterlogging, cyclone, displacement, and so on. So what that brought us to the realization that some of these development intervention or whatever we were trying to change was not going to be not going to happen and was not going to be feasible unless we understood the bigger picture. And the bigger picture was the climate change. The climate change induced disasters, the frequency, the, the whole uh, risk uh, that was associated with it. And when going to the community, our suggestions or solutions were obviously not working. I mean, when I spoke to a, a member of the community living in the chore, and she said that, what are you going to do for me? Because every uh, when I go to sleep uh, and I wake up in the morning, I see a part of my house lost to river erosion. This is happening in, more often than it used to before. Or I have to move to uh, address floods and so on. So then we started working on what we call community research or Gono Gobeshana. And the whole idea of that research was, what do you have? What are the resources? What is your situation? What is your reality? And what are the issues and problems you're facing? This is what we tried to learn and understand with the community. And then we mapped out the resources. Then we tried to understand the solutions. And we brought that because ActionAid also is involved in national advocacy and lobbying. And we were lobbying with the national government. We were lobbying with the researchers and academics. And fortunately, that learning helped us to come back and talk to the researchers, talk to the academics that, you know, you have to bring the science and people's experiences together and find a synergy somewhere. We need, um, the scientific explanations need to be put in a way where the community can understand because we can't come up with solutions without engaging and involving the community, listening to them. Now, uh, the flood uh, protection group, the embankment lobby, we'll always talk about the embankment. But when I was talking to the community, they said, we don't want another embankment here. The embankment actually creates flooding water logging. So then the solution, what is good for a uh, coastal area may not work for another area. So these are the learnings that we had. So our expectations for the research community is that there is the scientific aspect of it. There is the climatology or there's the whole science uh, discourse, but you need to link that with what's happening on the ground. Listen to the community, listen to some of the solutions they have. They, these solutions are part of the adaptation because they have managed to survive. 
they have adapted, you know, they have moved house, they have gone to a higher plane, they have tried to find a different water source, they have tried to protect the water source. They, even as I speak today, I'm working with women farmers who live in areas which is prone to flooding. So they are doing sack farming. They, you know, they're doing seed conservation. These are things that we learn from them. We did not know as development into, uh, you know, actors or as uh, activists that this is what is possible. And the knowledge, the learning, the seed preservation, all this we took and we could help them to address the disasters or the risks they are facing. So one of the expectation is to have practical understanding of the situation, the, uh, the, uh, the, the communities and how they're adapting to it and then come up with alternative solutions. So we should not just be focusing on the listening side of it. We should also be trying to come up with solutions. Now there is a problem with both us uh, development practitioners and the donor community that we try to impose from the top. We try to bring an experience from somewhere else to try and bring it and try to apply it to another scenario, which may or may not work. So we need some flexibility uh, among the researchers, among ourselves to be able to adapt and be agile. And the climate change now with COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic has really shaken us. Just as we were trying to address the whole COVID health issue and uh, livelihood and life uh, issues, we were faced with Cyclone Amphan and uh, we had to deal with flood and, uh, you know, it's already we've had four rounds. So this is where we need some practical and um, solutions that the community can work with and that can be applied. And this will help us to influence the policymakers. Now, uh, you know, because of all this advocacy and lobbying, our prime minister today has taken this to the UN 75th uh, session and talked about the planetary crisis, the climate uh, crisis and the urgency of it. It was a very long response, but I hope it made sense. Thank you very much, Farah. No, I think this was uh, this was a really good um, uh, lead in. I think your point about uh, connecting science with the lived experience is is really well taken. That is something that is pretty critical. I think you also uh, highlighted an important, uh, maybe a shift in, in thinking that's needed from just saying, well, we, we have some knowledge which we have to apply to saying, well, we let's start by understanding first what the problem is and what the solutions already might be existing and then use the scientific tools that we might have to perhaps even validate or improve uh, those solutions. So rather than coming in with a preconceived notion. So I think those, those are really good ideas. Um, with that, let me turn to our next panelist, um, uh, Dr. Shiraz um, uh, Baji. Uh, Shiraz is president of the Gorakhpur Environmental Action Group. Um, and also an associate professor at Gorakhpur University. So really someone who, again, uh, combines the worlds of action and the worlds of, of science. Um, uh, he's more than 30 years of experience on sustainable livelihoods in ecologically stressed situations in both rural and urban areas uh, through participation of community institutions. So I think his experience there will be really valuable to us. And he's been a part also of a number of uh, global and international research programs, uh, including ACORN and the Risk to Resilience Project. So let's uh, turn over and, uh, and I'd like to pose uh, to Shiraz uh, a question that building on this last intervention from, from Farah, uh, how do you see knowledge as ac actually being either a barrier or an enabler for action? And how can we actually put into place uh, this term that we have heard on, on co-production. How do we actually make that happen at that local scale? Over to you. Thank you, Anand. And actually, uh, some of the earlier speakers have made my, I mean, the, the, have already set the stage and the way uh, uh, for me. Uh, I will uh, be talking actually uh, on, in the context of uh, the urban uh, climate change resilience. And in that context, I would like to talk, uh, I mean, give the background that while working on the urban climate change resilience and the urban resilience, uh, what we realize that it is I mean, as important as to work in the urban area and 
equally important is also to work in the peri-urban spaces or the peri-urban ecosystems, which play a very significant role in providing the urban resilience. So uh, the whole issue is like, I mean, the background is like, uh, uh, there is a win-win situation between the urban resilience and the livelihood of the people who are living around the cities who are dependent on primary production activities, agricultural activities, and who are dependent on the ecosystem services. So uh, if you improve the ecosystem services, it, it improves the livelihood situation in the peri-urban spaces, as well as provides the uh, resilience to the urban setups. So that is the kind of uh, complementarity between the two spaces which are around the city. Now I'll be talking in this context, uh, uh, the community being the co-travelers in the research and knowledge generation and how uh, they actually contributed for developing the knowledge of the technology, which helps uh, the resilience building processes. Uh, one of the example is like, I mean, how the participatory resilient technologies can be developed. And we all know that there is a huge, I mean, just now Farah also talked about the indigenous knowledge that the communities have. And at the same time, uh, there is a synergy. I mean, there is a lot of science and technology which is available. The real challenge against the farmers is uh, the kind of appropriateness and accuracy of the technology which is being given in the name of the resilient technology because those technologies are many times they are not suitable in the in not in the local agroecological context and so on so that is not very appropriate in terms of providing the resilience to the socioeconomic classes for which we have been working so here uh, i'll be talking on uh, the example how the uh, the science uh, and the indigenous knowledge around diversity, complexity, recycling, ecosystem services that help to synergize these two and finally evolving some solutions like multi-layer farming or portable nursery or crop rotation, which was quite helpful uh, for the farmers to develop their farms and develop their resilience capacity and ultimately leading to the urban resilience. The second example of the case, which I would like to mention here is also uh, the participatory threshold analysis. Uh, this is again, uh, kind of giving language to data. There's a lot of data actually, which is coming to the communities in terms of warnings, in terms of weather advisories and so on. But how understandable this data is? That is a big question. And then uh, the, the idea was to, uh, behind this uh, process was like, to match the historical rainfall in the flood and water logging area with the kind of inundation which physically happens on the GPS locations in a particular community or in a particular space. And that actually provides the kind of uh, uh, linkage between the rainfall and the kind of inundation which will take place in the field or in the inhabitation, inhabited uh, uh, locations and so on. And that was very helpful uh, in converting the uh, knowledge or the data which comes through the advisories or through the warning system, and then farmers and the local communities can very easily understand and act uh, for the preparedness and adaptation also. So uh, these two examples also show that there are some benefits actually. Uh, there are some co-production of this co-production of the needed knowledge. One is that uh, this whole issue of this wicked vertical top-down process of extension is broken and it becomes farmers to farmer or community to community extension. That is very useful and it is very much in usable form. That is the one benefit which we saw, uh, which comes through these process of participatory technology development or uh, the co-travelers uh, in the technology development. The second is that it also triggers a lot of innovation, the local innovation. And that is also very helpful how the innovations can be evolved in the local agroecological context by the socioeconomic weaker communities. And that is also something which is very, very helpful. And finally, it also supports a knowledge-based leadership. So the leadership, which is largely on the political and the uh, other uh, hierarchical issues, that actually starts converting into a knowledge-based leadership, which is very helpful and also provides the uh, adaptation contribution to the whole process. So uh, finally, uh, in your words, like, I mean, it is also scaling the knowledge of solution rather than uh, only talking of uh, the problems. Thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you very much, Shiraz, and thank you for those very concrete, uh, I think, examples and ideas of, of how one may uh, make this happen in practice. I also, I think, want to, uh, was particularly struck at the end by your point that uh, knowledge can also help under address some of the core underlying structural factors or political economy factors that can often uh, be a barrier uh, to adaptation or resilience. So I think that bringing that knowledge makes things uh, makes things much more uh, improves that that process. And also, I think the ability to blend. Uh, so this, we don't not really looking at a conflict between traditional and modern, but really trying to see how uh, modern technology. I mean, your example of GPS is a very good one. One can actually make use that creatively. Uh, along with uh, existing solutions and approaches. Um, so, so very, very helpful um, examples there. Um, let's turn to our next um, panelist, um, Daniel Morshain. Um, uh, Daniel is a policy advisor uh, with the Resilience Program of IISD. It's, it's a major global N NGO, and he leads the national adaptation planning processes in Colombia and Peru. So we are kind of moving up in scale now from local uh, to national. And, and I think, again, an important step as we start looking at the potential connections between uh, these different scales, but his experience at the national scale will prove to be particularly um, interesting and relevant. Uh, before IISD, Daniel was a senior advisor in the uh, Climate Change Adaptation and Resilience Program at Oxfam. Uh, so again, comes to us with experience from the a world of civil society. Uh, and a major focus of his work is risk and vulnerability assessment through cross-scalar participatory and multi-stakeholder processes. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me hand over to, to Daniel and, and let's hear from him about his experiences. And in particular, uh, perhaps uh, from his experiences in the ASAR project, uh, how uh, they were able to successfully build linkages between science and policy processes, especially at the national level, and getting buy-in from these different communities who often, uh, you know, as has been pointed out, tend to remain isolated from each other. Uh, so overcoming their barriers to, to collaboration and connection. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Anand. Thanks for the opportunity. Before jumping to the to the Asar example, I wanted to take a little minute to talk about the why research for impact matters. Yeah, and I think you know many reasons have been given already today, but I think we also need to say that you know we need research to be linked to climate action because of the money that is there available for research and uh, adaptation efforts are struggling to to get enough funding. But in addition to that, I think the idea that uh, you know adaptation needs to also understand and find its own identity. It's struggling for its own identity. I would even say, you know, it, the mindset that uh, of adaptation at the moment remains stuck in productive sectors. A lot of the work keeps to be fo remains focused on agriculture, energy industry, and we uh, remain obsessed. Everyone, I would say, working on the sector on measuring the impact through numbers, understanding, trying to under, understand what an effective adaptation is by trying to pin it down to a number. That also means that the knowledge that is uh, prioritized when it comes to uh, addressing adaptation, understanding these uh, problems and solutions of adaptation, there's, there's sort of two levels. One level is, uh, you know, certain specialists like climatologists, engineers, meteorologists, who in my view, you know, these are the people who are gonna kind of running the game and uh, determining a lot of what happens in terms of an adaptation solution. On the other hand, you have other types of knowledge. Think of anthropologists, uh, NGOs, uh, women's rights organizations who are in a way they're in the basement. And that, uh, in my opinion, again, you know, this is, their knowledge is deprioritized. It's not really taken into consideration. It's not really seen from the beginning as part of the solutions that have to be identified. And you know, you, you have to ask yourself, why? Why is this happening? How could this uh, be the case? Um, luckily, I would say the, the kind of uh, the, the powerful researchers are actually also struggling now because uh, they realize that they need uh, more and more of these other types of knowledge in order to generate impact through their research. So this struggle, I think, is an important one. And, um, uh, and they, I think, uh, you know, the, the trick here is to see the adaptation solution 
as a pursuit of social well-being rather than, I'm going to say, like a, a, an approach that just simply reduces risk. Um, so that marriage can happen between these two types of knowledges. Uh, the research and the impact can be complementary, but now I find it is, is mostly broken. Um, jumping to the idea of uh, how to build linkages between science and policy. I agree with a lot of what the speakers have said in terms of we need to move to the solutions, but I'm going to take a step back and say that we also need to spend more time in the problem understanding because precisely from what I was saying before, there is often this uh, jump immediately to what are the solutions. And if you jump to that too quickly, then you are uh, preempting that solution based on what the predominant knowledge is telling you, right? So uh, I would say, define the research, spend more time there uh, on understanding the, the real problems that are important to address. Less, I dare say, on methodology, theoretical frameworks, more on understanding the relevance of the work. Whilst I think this is a good idea, I think it's very difficult to implement in reality because not everybody can spend this time. Universities can generally do this. Their, their uh, funding systems mostly enable it, but uh, CSOs, NGOs, uh, think tanks, you know, they don't have the funding type of system to enable this building of partnerships for research work. Therefore, they are kind of blocked by the way that things are set up. Collaboration in a way is, is set up from the, or is, is uh, prevented from the beginning, right? Um, so we need to change how the system is working to allow this fair collaboration between academics and non-academics that I think would have very positive outcomes for academics as well in the sense of a boosting research for impact. And I think, you know, these organizations that I was talking about, the non-academic organizations, the advantage is that they have this kind of like better understanding of policymakers' needs. They can speak the language and facilitate the transition of research to use. But now to also talk a little moment about the, the SR example from that, uh, uh, that the research project, the five years research project. Let me mention some work we did in Botswana. And there, the, what I want to bring up is that we use the vulnerability assessment and risk assessment methodology that was designed by an NGO, in that case, Oxfam, uh, to understand the problem in a very collaborative way from local, uh, but also bringing to the, to the uh, to the discussion, district level people. I think that was very important. We just don't look at the problem just from a local perspective, but bringing other higher level national authorities into that, as well as researchers. That enabled the awareness of district officials to really kind of see what was the story, what was happening, how was climate change affecting livelihoods, how was climate change affecting really development uh, in the country, but also it created kind of simple specific ideas. It told local stories. How do we move from here? So that narrative was created and the process was very informal and, and constructive. And that combination really enabled the district level officials to insert these uh, priority stories, these uh, ideas into the district development plan in a very concrete way. And also it was the first time that in the district development plan, you had basically um, an entry point to climate change. Climate change had not been discussed before because it, had, it was seen as something perhaps too complex to address. So why this worked in the SR project, I think there's, there's three points. One is that the district people, the district decision makers saw solutions and not problems. You know, I mean, they saw the problem, but also like, what do we do about this? But those solutions were uh, not simpler, but less obscure. You know, they said, okay, now, now we can relate to that. Now we can understand better through the stories that were being generated through the, the, by the people themselves, the, the community members themselves. Um, we also gained a lot of support from national government, not from the beginning, but once they saw that there was, there was an impact to be had at the local level and that it was actually helping rather than just posing a thousand million more questions. So then the national level jumped on board and they said, okay, great, let's mushroom this all over the country. And they supported that whole process very much. And finally, also that the research program was adaptable. It was actually very adaptable. We didn't have like fixed budgets to do A, B, and C, but that A, B, and C could evolve as we moved along. That adaptability of budgets and outcomes was uh, was fantastic. And you know, uh, just to find the close today, um, the, this kind of process is continued. I emailed my colleague yesterday from Botswana just to check how, wh what is going on now. And she got back to me and told me, listen, uh, in two weeks, we're starting such a, a similar uh, exercise for uh, a, a research project in Gaborone in the capital city. So you see that when there is a use, when there is a, a, a benefit coming out of that, it seems to be uh, continuing. And that's why I'm optimistic that the, the, the collaboration of knowledges can actually work and, and uh, 
it can be sustainable in the long term. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think those were really inspiring examples. I think your point about the fact that change is needed, not just in the world of research or academia, but also in the world of action, uh, that sometimes uh, that tends to be so driven by numbers and short-term outputs that you might lose sight of uh, longer-term outcomes that may be important. And I think also your point about the better understanding of the problem space, so not just in terms of, um, of climate, but also more fundamentally in terms of, you know, who is at risk, how are they at risk, why are they at risk, kind of can help in, in, in getting people better calibrated to what, you know, what might be done. Um, so I think, again, very, very helpful um, uh, comments. Um, I'd like to turn to, uh, to um, Dr. Uh, Lapulogang Magole. Uh, Lapo is a senior lecturer at the University of Botswana, so we are we are going back to uh, uh, a little bit your examples there, uh, Department of Architecture and Planning, and a regional development planner by profession, so someone who comes from the world of uh, academia, but has worked very closely uh, with action and with policy and planning processes. Um, uh, her research work and interest covers natural resource planning and governance in general and common property resource management in particular. This is a very critical segment in terms of adaptation. Um, currently, she works on city resilience to climate variability and change. And uh, I think Dr. Margole's experience with, uh, with actually getting some of, again, getting the buy-in uh, and getting the linkages uh, across these communities would be very helpful. And I believe that you will be showing a couple of uh, slides with your presentation. So over to you. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, I guess I'll just simply start off from where Daniel left because uh, the project he was uh, referring to, um, we have taken on some methodologies that were used in ASA and Fractal in order to continue our journey with the uh, CT who we are working with. So I'll provide an example from um, a regional uh, research project that is called Fractal, um, which has uh, tried its best to um, adopt a climate action research and uh, I'll present the case of Haboroni City, how we've done it uh, there and what benefits and challenges we think we have faced. Um, Fractal uh, stands for the future resilience for African cities and lands and uh, is implemented especially in the southern uh, part of Africa and is uh, coordinated by the University of uh, uh, Cape Town and uh, is funded by NEC. Now I would like to bring your attention especially to um, the aim of the project which I think lends it um, for action research. It says it wants to provide information that is accessible, timely, applicable I only believe that it is only action research or whatever version of it that you are applying that can provide accessible, timely, and applicable um, information or research. Because I think information or research is only accessible, timely, and applicable if it has been demanded by those who are going to use it. So um, the interest is to produce such information so that it may be used by the cities that we are working with. Again, in Botswana and perhaps even other countries in Southern Africa, our greatest challenge has been implementation of all these ideas, innovation, research that has been done by researchers and other experts. And the problem with that is that it has not received much ownership from those who are supposed to um, implement it. And therefore, the um, tendency has been uh, to look for a methodology that involves all those who are going to be affected by that information, who are going to be affected by that innovation, who are going to need that innovation to be involved from the very start in order to be able to use it in the end. So that's the Southern African team. So for me, therefore, um, action research is a transformative approach. It is an approach you use when you want to not only just change, but transform, because transformation comes from the inside out. Um, it is also a platform for core learning and core creating and therefore when it is presented like that, like Daniel was saying, it receives support, both financial and um, um, actual implementing and actual um, ownership by all those who are involved. So 
by our action research, we wished to create a platform for co-learning and for co-creating because we believe that a lot of times researchers and experts go into a situation and come out without having learned anything because of leaving that knowledge that other people have behind and sort of presenting their own as the only and uh, the most superior or the most useful um, information. So we embarked into a situation that takes from the methodology that uh, was being talked about earlier, where we convened a team um, from the system and then observed together what is happening and constructed stories about what we thought was happening. Now, constructive stories brought us to a space where we were using language that everybody can understand. So it wasn't all that uh, scientific, you know, um, uh, uh, high impact general stuff, but it was stuff that people could relate with, with their, in their own language. And then we discovered together what could be done. And then we made strategies for action all together. So so it was like researchers and other interested parties such as donors and other uh, partners that we have in the region as well as government um, officials and legislators um, and as also civil society representing the communities who came through in order for us to co-create knowledge co-create solutions and action strategies. How did we do that? We embarked into the first uh, stage that we embarked was of narrative stories, where we placed the city of Kaborone somewhere in the future. And all of us um, created a story and a vision of what we think the environmental, social, health, and economic impacts of climate change would be at that time. And we also together um, talked about who are the stakeholders who are supposed to be involved in this visioning and in this um, story? And we we mobilized all the uh, all the stakeholders or all the uh, uh, yeah stakeholders who are supposed. To, and then we did a survey of um, uh, stakeholders. The survey was done to put um, a, a, a baseline to understand to have an understanding of where we are coming from, especially in as far as the climate change understanding and uh, the association of what. Um, each group believed to be uh, climate change and the impact that they see on the ground on their uh, everyday life. And then we also did a, a visioning map and modeling together. So now this brought the stakeholders to a place and uh, to a space where they felt that this is about us. This is about whatever comes out of this is going to give us something uh, that we imagine where we would like to be in the future. So we did a visioning map and a modeling of the situation as we want to be together in the, in the city. So um, with that, we have moved to a very interesting phase where the city has actually decided to adopt what we are doing and take it further and use it for an actual planning process. The city's um, development plan and a lot of its supporting documents are due for review. So they have decided that we work on a document that looks at the climate change mainstreaming opportunities that are within that development plan. Uh, the reason we are looking for mainstreaming opportunities and nothing more than that is because the city is not a climate change authority. There's a national climate change authority that works from up there, but the city feels that it has things that it is doing, that it is implementing on the ground, where it can already take on what has come out from the stories and the modeling that they have done and put it within the, uh, the urban development plan, which is which of which they are the authority and they are the ones who are going to um, implement. So we have had small focus uh, and we continue to have small focus group discussions that look at the chapters of the development plan and come up with the uh, mainstreaming opportunities. And the next is we are going to go into a mainstreaming workshop where we are going to document all these mainstreaming opportunities. And in the coming year, the city is going to venture into reviewing and renewing its plan. And all these will be fitted into areas where they can now be budgeted for for implementation and given resources. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think I will stop here and wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. I think it's really nice to see this uh, very structured example uh, of a process that actually then uh, mainstreams uh, uh, climate considerations into a formal development planning process and development plan documents. I think it's really interesting to see how that playing out in practice, because I think, as you said, this is one way of institutionalizing the process and making sure that this will continue 
uh, as we as we go along. So again, thank you very much for that uh, for that example from from Fractal. Um, from cities, uh, maybe we can again shift gears a little bit and turn to uh, agriculture, uh, which is another sector where climate information uh, is particularly important and remains challenging uh, as how do we effectively deliver the information that's needed uh, to the farmers uh, who need it and the kinds of decisions that they might take using that information. So very fortunate to have uh, DC Martinez Baron, who is the regional program leader for Latin America. Uh, she comes to us from the CGIAR system. Again, uh, a very important uh, key research uh, organization, research network, um, uh, and within CGIAR, the CCAFS program, which is climate change and agriculture. And we'd like to hear from uh, about uh, their experiences with climate information and how do we uh, ensure effective uptake and utilization of climate information and decision making at that farm level. And uh, maybe also thinking a little bit about do we have the right level and kind of funding uh, that we need to produce appropriate and usable climate information and what more can be done uh, to make sure that that happens well. So over to you. Thank you very much, Anand, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. I will share our experience on the local technical agroclimatic committees in Latin America as a successful way to do action research and generate impact when in, while enabling adaptation to climate change and variability in the agricultural sector. Next slide, please. So what was the problem? Farmers experience climate, uh, extreme climate conditions from one year to another uh, with, the, with significant losses in their crops and agricultural systems are, present, are very sensitive to climate, but are not uh, resilient to it. So in consequence, farmers need information, climate information, but they have limited access to it to plant their crops. When they have access to such information, they don't get it on time or they hardly understand it. And when they understand it, they don't know how to use it because it is not actionable or contextualized letting farmers alone in the decision-making processes. So in this context, plant, farmers plant their crops based on what happened the previous year, which given the climate variability due to climate change, that does not seem uh, to the way, the way to go. Next slide, please. So the local technical agroclimatic committees are spaces for dialogues between a diversity of local stakeholders seeking to understand climate, most likely behavior in a territory and to generate recommendations to reduce risk associated to the expected climate variability. So, so these L tags have three main ingredients, the climate outlook, the expert knowledge, climate scientists, for example, and local knowledge from farmers, rural extensionists, and so on. So based on that information, they discuss aspects such as how the crops will be affected, when and what to plan, etc. And then they develop their recommendations based on that discussion to farmers on what climate smart practices to implement to avoid losses and or increase productivity. An external study on the approach found that the L tax are transforming agriculture in four main areas. Confidence in the quality of climate and agroclimatic information. So now that farmers and local stakeholders know how the information is produced as well as their benefits and limitations. And this has allowed to them to use that information to understand it and use it in their decision-making processes. The second area was the democratization of agroclimatic knowledge. So now the information is known, understandable and connected to the territories. The third area was the transformation in productive practices. So now farmers are making decisions based on the information they receive. And the fourth area was the national institutional policy changes. Those inter-institutional alliances that were built in the local, but also in the national and across the scale, uh, across the scales in order to promote risk management. Next slide, please. But how do we get to this transformation that I just mentioned? So first we identify the needs of the farmers and the local stakeholders to deal with climate variability. We understood the climate information flows and networks as well as the stakeholders in the territory that main crops and climate risk associated with uh, their crops. 
Then we work together with med service institutes and partners such as IRI from Columbia University to develop better in, uh, climate and crop predictions. And, as, and, and third, as we work from the beginning with local and national institutions and organizations, we were able to enhance their capacity with better climate and crop modeling tools for the MED institutes and ministers of agriculture, as well as growers or associations. Uh, on participatory methodologies to strengthen farmers' technical staff and rural extensionists to share uh, in climate information and to understand it and use it. And also in Colombia, for example, we supported the NDC formulation process by including the ES, this LTAC approach as a prioritized adaptation action. Next slide, please. So what has been the result? Today, the LTAC approach is implemented in 10 Latin American countries led by local and national institutions. This effort has involved the strengthening of capacity to co-produce, translate, transfer and use climate information for agriculture in more than 300 institutions in Latin America. Currently, we have an estimate of 250,000 farmers receiving tailored agroclimatic information and incorporated into their decision making processes. So now going back to your question, Anand, I think that to ensure effective uptake of and use of climate information by farmers, we need to use the appropriate language and a scale to produce that information, as well as deliver that information on time. That means before planting, uh, season, etc. And in relation to the level of funding and the kind of funding, I would say that we still need funding to understand local climate risks and, and, and how that affects the whole environment and the whole landscape and territory of the, of the rural communities. But also I think that most importantly, we, we need uh, funding to do more, so, more research on soil, social sciences. We need more social scientists working with uh, uh, meteorologists, working with uh, agronomists and all these uh, different disciplines to better understand our role and the role of the people that we want to benefit from and understand what are their dynamics, social dynamics and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Desi. This was very helpful, and I think some very clear uh, suggestions and recommendations from you as well about how to make this enterprise work. And I think starting with understanding the user and the way information is getting used and for what purpose uh, before we start getting into the supply side of generating that information is is an important uh, is an important idea. Um, and I think this actually leads us very nicely to our next uh, panelist, uh, Jenny Frankel Reed. Uh, Jenny uh, is a climate adaptation advisor who works with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, again, a very key uh, player as a foundation supporting work in this space, where she fo focuses on adaptation agricultural development in Sub Saharan Africa and South Asia. She spent, comes to uh, BMGF after a decade at USAID, uh, again in the development space where she led the agency's climate adaptation team uh, and, uh, and supported a large development assistance portfolio with programs in many countries. Uh, and she's also worked uh, with coordinating a USAID NASA partnership called Servir, which equipped developing countries across five regions with satellite data uh, models and related uh, knowledge. Um, so Jenny, uh, from your um, uh, experience uh, uh, so far, and now in your role at, uh, at BMGF, how do you see the uh, pickup and use of science and science-based information in sort of these decision-making processes at different scales? Uh, what role do you see foundations like BMGF playing in this process? Over to you, Jenny. Thanks so much. Um, a quick thanks to the conveners on FCDO. These are really critical questions if we're going to ultimately adapt to climate change because we have so much to learn and, and so quickly. So we have been talking about action research for development for society in a fairly common way, but I want to highlight just a few features um, that I think are, are important. The first is addressing critical societal needs, and that's where we start with action research. Second is tapping into the knowledge and strengths of both scientists and decision makers or stakeholders. And that's the you know, issues around user-centered and, and co-developed. 
And the third point is it's carried out in a way that supports action, supports learning and builds capacity. And I think those are each a, a, a bit different, um, but really should guide us as we talk about action research. So as Anand mentioned, um, the Servier partnership, the, the program between USAID and NASA, um, supported regional organizations in five regions in Africa, Asia, and Latin America to help them access earth science and satellite data to support their national, local, and regional stakeholders to manage risks and resources sustainably. From that work and other work, there are many lessons learned and a lot of both successes and failures. Um, so the, I'll share a few of those. So it, it took a lot of time to arrive at a shared vision around action research because everyone has to get to know each other, understand what everybody brings to the table, build the skills to actually communicate across disciplines and change culture and, and practice around what we do. So culturally on the science side, I think there is a bias that the best research is the most innovative or novel. But action research means that the best research is the most useful to the most people. And culturally, I think in the development space, we don't always bring the most rigorous evidence or you know, even not the most rigorous evidence, but sufficient evidence to the table. So bridging those two kind of cultural biases, I think those are in front of, we're confronted with that. And we made some innovations in terms of how we invested to, to, to kind of connect across. So USA made long-term institutional investments in those regional organizations so that they could engage decision makers, facilitate collaboration, and rather than delivering one-off solutions or data products, the, the goal was to strengthen their capacity as science service providers. So that's a really different thing than um, you know, a product or, a, or a, 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 a report. NASA also invested really differently by um, including in their research calls for proposals, including panelists from those developing country institutions on the selection committee for a first phase. And then after that selection had been made, co-investigators were required on all of the proposals for the full proposals to ensure that national and regional expertise were actually a part of the research that NASA was funding. And that was a really uh, major shift in how that worked. The regional organizations themselves had to slow down their work. They had to dig deeper in their consultations they had to really interrogate the decision makers more to understand how to bring the most valuable research insights to, to their work. So those, those are major, major changes. A few failures, I think, well, not failures, but challenges. It is hard to facilitate dialogue between uh, research and development. It's not the same skill set as the best agriculture modeler or, you know, um, ecosystem science scientist, it is not the same language. So learning how to speak each other's languages uh, really does take some effort. It's also challenging to bridge all the way to, from decision relevant to action. So there's a lot that gets in the way of actual um, action and use of the science that we may be providing. Um, are the resources available to act on what's there? So I think being very careful about um, the assumptions that we have going into our action research investments is key. And then, you know, a final point that I think the adaptation agenda has really not benefited from the climate science led approach to bring downscaled long term climate data to the table first, it really and we have started to see a shift to start with, you know, what are the development challenges and then what is the relevant information that we can bring um, to, to those to those issues. So I'll end with a few recommendations. Um, how do we ensure the use of science and decision making and the role for you know, philanthropy? The first is about partnering. So we can all imagine ways that science can support adaptation. Can we get ahead of a drought or a flood risk to reduce losses or get ahead of favorable agricultural conditions to boost livelihoods? or reach a specific population with climate resilient products or inputs or services that they need. But unless it is our loss or our gain, or we are that customer, 
we don't fully know the opportunities from action for action from the outside. And most of us are on the outside. So we must appreciate fully those local partners who know what's valuable, when they need that warning or that information to take action, how women will benefit from the, from the research, how things should be communicated. And so those, the right partnerships are really crucial um, in order to shape uh, what's valuable applied action research. Next is the science push. So, you know, societal benefit has to be more valued in the science community. Um, we should have no research without co-authorship from the regions uh, and the communities where we're working. And we have to really reward partners that want to do things differently with a visibility around the impact of their efforts in the research space. From the action poll side, we have to support a culture of science-based, evidence-based decision-making. And we need to uh, provide access to the tools and skills in the development space to engage more with science and, and be more um, loyal and faithful to the evidence that, that, we're, that we're providing. And finally, where funders come in, like the Gates Foundation, is in finding those weaknesses in the system, finding those gaps and those spaces and fostering the connections in those spaces. So what's left out in traditional research and development activities and investing in um, those spaces that can be hard to fully value and fund. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jenny. Really clear recommendations. And I think uh, your points are very well taken about how we can, uh, particularly I found was struck by your, your mention of, of rewards and incentive structures and how we can uh, tweak those to actually make uh, the kinds of changes we need to see happen both on the side of science um, uh, and in the field of action. And that actually brings us very nicely to our, um, uh, our last panelist, Dr. Judy, Omumbo, who is with the African Academy of Sciences. And I think a number of times during the conversation today, we have talked about issues such as transdisciplinarity, uh, incentive structures for science and scientists, and how do we shift some of these institutions that are very traditional sometimes uh, in their approach uh, to science and what, what science is valued uh, as well. Um, uh, Judy is uh, the... Um, uh, is a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences, and she also works at the AAS as a senior program manager for the postdoctoral programs, affiliates, and climate scientists. Uh, she, as a scientist, she has worked for decades in global health as an epidemiologist and a public health policy specialist. Uh, she sits on the WMO Research Board and the WMO COVID-19 Task Force, uh, is a member and former co-chair of the Climate Research for Development Scientific Advisory Committee. Um, so I think given her background, both as a public health uh, scientist and at the African Academy of Sciences, she'd be very well placed to help us understand what some of the challenges you see in supporting and incentivizing action research and interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research that has this strong user focus and how we synergize research with long-term institutional and human capacity. Over to you, Judy. Well, thank you very much, and, and I'd like to also thank the organizers of this webinar, the conveners, uh, my, my co-panelists, and also those of you who are attending and listening so very keenly. Uh, I never underestimate the, the value of a conversation, and it's good always to start with a conversation so that we understand who we are, and uh, this, is, this is a way that, that most um, successful treaties are signed and implemented. So um, I work at the African Academy of Sciences, as you uh, just heard. So the perspectives that I give are uh, related to our experiences in Africa. Um, it may be different in other parts of the world, but just to start by saying that, you know, obviously we know that Africa is a large continent, but very often when it comes to setting agendas, uh, um, setting policies, uh, sustainable development goals and so on, Africa is sometimes treated as one large country. Now, there are policies, there's agendas uh, set globally, the sustainable development goals that Africa follows regionally for adaptation and for a million other things at country level and even at subnational level. 
And I think a good starting place is to, to, recognize, uh, to recognize that, that, that in order for research to be of interest at all to policymakers, one must to understand, you know, this, this dilemma or this uh, challenge that we have of policy. So the research needs to address that policy. Um, I think at the um, at the academy, we're very well, we're very well aware of this. You know that we must we must start with the well, first with the policy makers. Research is very much driven by funding uh, on this continent, and therefore, for governments to find any interest in the research, they must see that it will address what they define as priorities. For after many years of, of working with people, you get to meet diff people in different sectors. And uh, one of the most interesting conversations I had, and I can't really remember which policymaker it was, was around how uh, we bring climate science and climate research to policy. There's a lot of talk of downscaling, uh, downscaling information, downscaling research funding, writing research funding so that policymakers can understand. And once, once turned around to me and said, well, yes, you know very well, but uh, perhaps I should downscale policies for you and also downscale the priorities so that you can see how you can address them. So there's, you know, there's, there's already a feeling from our side on the research that we have these solutions. And if we share them for you in a way you can uh, understand, they will address their, their, your problems. What we have really focused on at the Academy is understanding uh, policies and, and, and around why priorities are made. There are many things that need to be addressed, but how do you decide out of this big ocean of things that are important, what you want to do and what you're going to put your money to? So we have a program at the Academy, which looks, it's, it's called the, the Africa Priorities uh, Research Priorities Program, that really starts off with a blank page. We look at, we've looked at profit, uh, you know, climate change is one of the uh, strategic focus areas of, of the academy. We also have uh, issues that are priorities for Africa, maternal, neonatal and child health. And now in this uh, period of COVID, priorities for COVID. What do Africans feel need to be done first? So we've been experimenting with the use of the wisdom of crowds where the, the value now that we have all these, uh, you know, opportunities for webinars and can call researchers and stakeholders from many, many sectors together. Uh, and just to ask questions, a, a question like, look, these are all the, the, the whole range of things that could be done. What do you think is most important without pushing an agenda from any direction? And we found that even for climate change, uh, we, we, we collate all those answers and then see, which of the priorities come up in the greatest, you know, supported by the most people? So this doesn't have anything really to do with science. It's just the conversation, as I said, we had, we had started with. Now, we, we set the priorities in that way. Uh, we have tried other ways of also looking for priorities for, for, for different things. Um, and, then, and then our programs at the Academy uh, are aligned with us, those priorities. So overall, the agenda is, is to imp improve sustainable development in Africa, to improve, improve the lives of Africans through science. And then underneath uh, all of that, we pick those priorities and then make sure that all our programs in uh, our fellowship programs for research uh, address those priorities. Uh, program, uh, programs that are looking at innovation for Africa address those, program, those priorities. And then in that way, we ensure that the funding is going to, to right to the place where you know, the people who are, are impacted by, uh, by the issues need it. Now, I'm not going to say at all, I mean, as this is not a, a claim that we have found all the answers, but I think we need to really radically think through the way that we say that we, you know, we, we, we involve all parties in defining things for adaptation. You know, there's a, there's a real uh, feeling that if you take different ingredients and put them together in a walk, that you're going to get a really good result. I, and we all know that that doesn't always work. Some spices, some ingredients don't work with others and so on. It doesn't work. But I don't think that we really think about it when we're, when we're working in adaptation. That maybe 
it's time to say, let's, let's ask first from the policy level, what do, what do governments want right from the beginning, beginning? There's not going to be a major shift until finally governments in Africa start putting money into research. Because when the funder is funding, then there are priorities that may not necessarily be what, what governments have, have uh, listed as priorities. So to, in order for them to do this, then that, search, that research must address what they see as priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Shuri. And I think you raised a very important point, which is uh, how do we make sure that the overall research enterprise is, in fact, driven by uh, national and local needs? And, and one of the ways of doing that is to ensure that there is, in fact, domestic uh, funding uh, for research. So I think some, some really important uh, points coming up there. Um, I very much appreciate uh, everyone being here. Uh, we are actually at the end of our all allotted time. Uh, we've had a really rich discussion, some good Q&A. Uh, I'm sorry, we will not really have time for uh, Q&A at this stage since we are um, at the end of our uh, time. But I did want to open the floor for a minute if there were any panelists who wanted to make a closing comment based on what they have um, heard so far. Uh, so if any panelists would like to make a closing observation, let's uh, let's give that a minute or two and then we can we can wrap up. Can I? Please. Uh, uh, Ananda, I think we all need to come together because uh, we have a very strong opponent in terms of uh, when it comes to climate change, the political interest and national, uh, so-called so national interest uh, supersedes the bigger understanding of what we are faced with, the planetary crisis and the climate change. That, so uh, uh, in terms of uh, solutions, in terms of our advocacy lobbying, I think we all need to come together and move beyond the artificial divisions of you know, academics, scientists, development practitioners, and politicians. If we can get the message and uh, get them uh, to understand. But we also have a very strong opponent in the multinational corporate world who, are, uh, who understand but refuse to acknowledge the crisis that has, is there because of the present use of energy and fossil fuel and the infrastructure-based development. So we need to come together on that. that. That's what I wanted to emphasize. Thank you very much, Farah. Any other panelists? Okay, if not, I mean, I think this has been a really rich discussion. Uh, I don't, would not like to summarize it. We have captured all the observations in the Q&A box. Uh, this is a dialogue to be continued, uh, and we are really grateful to the panelists for uh, giving us their time, to all, all of you in the uh, attendees who have, uh, who have stayed with us through this process. Um, I think there's been some very clear directions that have come up. Uh, the idea of uh, engagement, the idea of changing incentive structures to make it possible for collaborations to happen, uh, the idea of reorienting uh, research funding to make sure that it, it, it happens in a way that supports that engagement and not just uh, looks at um, uh, communities as objects of research, but actually as them driving the research agenda. Uh, so I think a lot, a lot on our plate uh, that calls for fundamental changes both in the world of action and in the world of uh, science and traditional science funding uh, to support this kind of a enterprise that, that makes a difference uh, at the end for building adaptation and resilience. Um, so, uh, so again, uh, if there are no other closing words from any of the panelists uh, from my behalf, I'd like to thank everyone. Um, and then I'd like to hand back uh, to, uh, to Juhi and to the Terry team at Adaptation Futures Secretariat. Thank you so much, Anand. And uh, thank you to all the panelists. On behalf of the hosts, Terry and Wasp, uh, I would like to thank you all for an extremely informative discussion on action-oriented research and to the participants for their questions, even though we unfortunately didn't have enough time for a Q&A session. 
Uh, it's been a very rich dialogue and we were very grateful for this opportunity to have heard from some of the leading experts in the field of climate change adaptation during the course of this webinar, which also saw over 100 participants join in from across the globe. Uh, we would like to invite you for tomorrow's webinar at 4.30 p.m. Indian time or 11.30 a.m. GMT on forecasting the future, uh, climate information and early warning systems. The agenda for this webinar is up on our website. And last but not least, we'd like to reiterate our thanks for the continued support and patronage of our sponsors, which is critical for the success of Adaptation Futures 2020. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you there tomorrow as well. Thanks.